play cryptography? Sure. sure. The easiest way to look at this is symmetric, then asymmetric, and combining both of those into a public key infrastructure and using digital certificates. That's the biggest picture. Break down as small as you want to, as granular as you want to, but after doing the mind maps for this, that's it. Symmetric, asymmetric, PGP. I'm sorry, public key infrastructure. There's a few exceptions like PGP. So, what portion of the IAC triad do you think we're going to be mostly working in in this section? Confidentiality. There are some integrity checks, but mostly confidentiality. So, whether the data is at rest in storage or in transmission, I need to make sure that only the people that need it get access to it. That's going to be a confidentiality piece. And while data is at rest or in transition, that it keeps its integrity. So you have trust in it. And we can enforce that through authenticity and proving that people do stuff with non-repudiation. <coughs> All right, so some basic, basic terminology 101 here. The algorithm set of rules used in encryption and decryption. Um, an algorithm and a cryptocism together really are a procedure. Because the cryptocism is the hardware software piece of it, the algorithm is the rules. You have a symmetric algorithm, that's how does it do what it does. In terms of procedural, like how do I take the data from plain text to make it in the cipher text, procedurally. Crypto analysis, analyzing cipher text, plain text, trying to break into cryptocisms or algorithms. And cryptography is just the science of. Any questions? He's gay. Cryptology, the study of both cryptology and cryptoanalysis. And then we get into some of the more, more common definitions. You had cipher text, this is the hidden stuff. You have plain text, that's the stuff you can read. And you're going to have a key. Key is going to get you into, well, will at least allow you to convert from plain text to cipher text and back and forth. The work factor is how much time, effort, money, and resources that's going to take. One strategy when you're encrypting stuff is to make the work factor just so extremely long, astronomically long, that people give up before they get to the data. That's why you have algorithms that will produce a work factor of 72 quadrillion years. I'm just not going to be around for that one. <coughs> so let's talk about strength for a second. You want to find out how strong something is or how many number of combinations there are? Two to the power of the bit size. So two to the power of 128 versus two to the power of 40. That's a common mathematical function here. Not that we have to do any sort of aggressive math, but it just helps to get the idea. So two to the xy of 128 versus 40. Which one do you think is going to be stronger, right? So the purpose is not to make comp uh, to make compromising the system impossible. Ah, the purpose is not to make the um, compromising the system impossible. I can't wait till we go to like neural computers or something and we have the ability to think like, you know, a thousand fold faster than, you know, our computers do today. I started to touch that with a little silicon switching back in the day, but, you know, that will speed up the, the process. What is more, now's a good time to talk about Moore's Law. Remember? Doubling every Double Processing months. speed doubles every 18 months. 18 months. So you could calculate that into that if it's doubling every 18 months, well then that's an exponential graph, not a linear. So even though we say 72 quadrillion years, that's based on today's computing power. So that is a linear assumption. So it probably won't take that long. A lot of, of argument right now about whether or not Moore's law will hold. Yeah, that's a pretty aggressive law, considering. Hi. So, 
cryptographic systems are designed to basically enforce components of the IAC triad. Confidentiality, integrity, prove that you are who you say you are. If you want access to something that's encrypted, well, you need to prove that you are who you say you are, so an authenticity. And then non-repudiation really means not denying. You don't have the ability to deny that anymore. You put your thumbprint on something or your fingerprint, whether a message digest or something that you did, and you send that along with your message to prove that you are the sender, that you did it. And if you prove that you did it, well, then you can't deny it. Make sense? The majority here will be confidentiality. We're going to add in, uh, well, let's, let's talk about this for a second. You might want to write this down. This is a good slide to write this down. Symmetric only deals with confidentiality. Only. Symmetric, symmetric algorithms only deal with confidentiality. Asymmetric algorithms, because of your private key that only you have, you can get confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation. So one of the strengths of symmetric is that it does confidentiality very, very well. It's extremely efficient in doing that. But the problem with symmetric is that it doesn't address integrity, authenticity, or non-repudiation. So you got to combine it with asymmetric to get those benefits. But you know, you could say, well, hey, why not let's do everything asymmetrically? But asymmetric algorithms are really, really slow, so it make, doesn't really make sense. But the, uh, there is some strategy into using asymmetric to secure your infrastructure and then using symmetric algorithms to encrypt the data. Now this is a, a very, very tricky subject here, folks. And you guys have got to understand what I mean with the things that I say. And that's not always easy for me, yeah, let alone than you guys. So uh, repeat that back to me. Asymmetric is slower, so it's slower. To configure the infrastructure. But the benefits of it are you get the whole triangle plus non-repudiation. Right. And but versus symmetric. Symmetric is so confidentiality only, but it's faster. Right. So if you so if you need to um, you need to encrypt large payloads, then you want to use symmetric keys. Right. Because they're much faster to encrypt a large payload. Good start. Good start. So confidentiality. Focus here, hiding stuff. Or if you look at it in terms of integrity, in this case we are moving things around. We are changing, altering, modifying, adding stuff, deleting stuff, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in this case it'd be the exact opposite of integrity. Because with integrity you want to prevent anybody from changing, modifying, altering, or deleting. Yeah, but you, but the, the trick is you want to alter it in a way that's recurrent. Right. Yeah, you can't just uh, you know encrypt it into Oblivia. You right. gotta have a, a, a known before and then a known after. That way you can go back. So you can't just hide it into uh, you know a sack of potatoes. There's different sizes of the encrypting algorithms. I call these giveaways. They, they're, they're giveaways because they let you know exactly, in some cases, exactly which algorithm you're talking about. Like if you see 168, we have to be talking about triple devs. If you see 128, see there are 128 AES, AES, which they normally say, or it's IDEA, most of the time. 56, historically DES, and then even weaker stuff like 40 bit. And integrity. Integrity is here to guarantee that nothing has been changed, modified, altered, or deleted in an unauthorized way. So we can prove that through a one-way function, which is where we take data, we analyze it, and we get an output. And I did the lab for you where I did the MD5 sum to the password up there. Exactly. We analyze that file, we get an out output. That output was called the message digest. Also, on a digital signature, there are off there you have integrity algorithms, and they will provide integrity. So that, but we're talking digital signatures. On a digital signature, that's asymmetric. So on an asymmetric piece, on the actual certificate itself, you can see SHA or MD5 or MD whatever it is. 
but the purpose, guarantee that the data has not been changed, modified, altered, deleted, any one of those integrity keywords will work just fine. Authentication, I told you what this is, what's this mean? It begins with a P. Gotta prove who you are. Prove it. Great, you're Bill Gates, prove it. Prove it. And in asymmetric, you better have what Bill Gates would have, and that would be his private key. That's the piece that he holds. So you have many different ways that you can actually authenticate somebody. You could base, authenticate somebody based off of the knowledge of the pre-shared key. So for example, I give you the password, and it's P-A-S-S-W-0-R-D-1, and you're the only person that knows that, I'm able to say, hey, it must have been you, because you're the only person I told. Not really a good way to authenticate people, though. Because what if he writes it down and somebody else reads it and calls me up and says, hey, password one. Well, I'm authenticating based off the knowledge of that, but it could be somebody else. But it is authenticating you off of something you know, if you want to write that down. Pre-shared key is something you know, or a digital certificate is something you have. So when we talk about authenticity, remember, it comes in three factors. Which ones are there? Something you know, something you have, something you are. Something you know, something you have, and something you are. Yeah. So we gotta look for that. Anytime we see the authenticity, what are we authenticating on? Something you know, something you have, something you are. And actually there's a fourth one that, that doesn't get a lot of talk, but there's also something you do, like typing, how you type, or gates, how you walk, if you walk with a limp or not. Remember the, uh, the movie um, Total Recall? when he walks through like the x-ray hallway and well you could see if maybe he had a pin in his leg versus somebody else had a pin in his leg and they had a, a you know a limp or something like that so different people do have physical characteristics that you can distinguish in how they do something uh, but your your key three or something you have something you know something you are but the purpose here is to prove identity and to tie non-repudiation to it that way you cannot deny actually doing something Non-repudiation is a good way to provide accountability. If you want to get accountability in Washington, D.C., start doing non-repudiation. Start tracking what people do. That way they can't deny it. Who did they meet with? Why did they meet with that person? How long did they meet with that person? Did they show up? Did they not show up? You can prove it. <clears throat> That's a log file. I don't mean, I'm not saying what the log file means. I'm just saying we get accountability as a result. Guarantees that the users cannot deny doing something. Or if you tie it to a statement, you can say, well, of course I said that. Prevents forgery because you are the one that did it. IAC Triad 101 there. All right, ciphers are the methods of actually transforming text in order to hide its meaning. So we're we talking about confidentiality or integrity. Confidentiality. Hiding, you see the word hiding? I mean, it's gotta mean confidentiality. You see the word transforming, that means moving stuff around. If it's moving something around, well, then it's been changed. So it can't be integrity. Different algorithms use different cipher lengths. For example, just the obvious 40 you know, DES versus like RC4 or something. Well, let's talk about these right here. You got substitution ciphers, transposition ciphers, and it's, it's a good idea for you to get this in the physical world. It makes the logical world feel much better. So substitution. What would have happened then if I were to take you out of this class and you got to leave the class and then somebody else comes in and take your place? What did I just do? Substitute. I substitute it. Or if you're on a football team, a player gets tired, one person gets taken out, another person gets taken in. Well, that concept of substitution still exists. But let's just do it in a way that, well, we'll talk about transposition in a second, but in this case, we're just replacing one with the other. Cryptography that happens normally with alphabets. Right? You take one alphabet out and you replace it with another, like the Caesar cipher. Transposition. Transposition means I, I can't take out and replace. So in this case, Len, I can't take you out of the class and replace you with somebody else, but I can move you around. I could move you to another seat. So right next to transposition cipher, write Rubik's Cube. 
good way to think about it. I can't take the pieces out, but I can move them around. Well, that's kind of how I won. I actually did, you know, take off the stickers in the corners and put them where I wanted to. That's the only way I could figure out how to beat the game. It's so hard. Rubik's Cube. Then you got running ciphers and concealment ciphers. and These are kind of creative. You can hide messages in play, plain sight. You could use the first uh, character of every word and then use that to add up a new word. You know, have you ever seen the movie uh, Number uh, Number Twenty Three? Yeah. yeah, right. Every twenty third word made up the twenty third chapter, something to that effect. I'm not gonna ruin the movie for you, but it's a good movie. It's a good cryptography movie if you feel like that stuff. All right, let's do block versus uh, stream. Let's say, Lynn, that uh, I got a pile of dirt here and I need it moved over here. Everybody's excited about that. Like, ooh, let's move dirt. Well, my choices are I can take a spoon, do one spoon full of time. How long is that going to take me? Mm -hmm. Long time. Long time. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's be a little bit more efficient. Now I take eight spoons, and I do eight spoons at a time. Less time. Less time, but still very, very slow, right? Mm -hmm. What if I take a wheelbarrow and start loading the wheelbarrow off? Less time. But I'll still do it. It's going to take a while, but uh, significantly faster now since I went from spoons to shovels. Well, stream ciphers are very, very small. There, I write this down. The bit or the byte level. So a bit is just one, you know, one zero or, or one one. Or a byte, a byte of information, which is eight bits. Agree or disagree? Agree. Mm -hmm. okay. A block cipher is different in that it's a collection of bytes. So you normally have a 64-bit block size. So that would be eight blocks. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, eight, eight, eight. I'm sorry, eight bytes. You have one byte, which would be eight bits, but then you have eight bytes that would be 64-bit. Agree or disagree? Mm -hmm. Found the math on that one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. I would relate stream ciphers more to like a variable. And they are. Small, small that's, a, on a, on a that's a good way of looking at it. Because if you want to take something from a satellite to the Earth, it's a basically a conveyor belt. But it encrypts basically per byte or per bit as it's going on that conveyor belt. So in many cases, if you want to encrypt something in transmission, a stream cipher is a great idea. If you want to encrypt something at rest, a block cipher is uh, an idea. And I use the example of uh, if you have a terabyte of hard drive space and you want to encrypt the whole drive, it's not going to make much sense to do it at the bit or the byte level. You're just going to be you're going to be there forever. But it would make sense to go ahead and and bulk it together and do bulk encryption based off of the block size. It's a larger increment. Agree or disagree? Agree. This is uh, everybody's got to be together on this stuff. Agree. Okay. So substitution. This is replacing one alphabet with another. Your example here is that if you say something like A equals B, B equals C, C equals D, D you know, etc. Then the word bad becomes the word CBE. Pretty basic, right? Have I talked about anything difficult yet? This is like Good Morning Cereal Box Fun. All right, you can play this game with your kids. They're literally the back of cereal boxes. But if this is plain, here you go, folks. See if you're paying attention. If this is plain text. This is cipher text. What is the key? What's the key here? What what, what gets me from this to this? The key is going to take uh, plain text to cipher text. Isn't that the key? What's the key? A B C D. The legend. Yeah, that's the conversion. But what's significant about the relationship of A to B? It's plus one. It's basically one. The alphabet rotated one click. Shift one. Shift one. So in this case, you're shifting the alphabet one. What if I shifted by three? I'd get a different set of, uh, you know, B would um, be uh, uh, C, D, E, right? A would become A, B, C, and D would become D, E, F. Yeah. Right? Well, that kind of brings up the fact that there are multiple kinds of substitutions, like shifts you can do. Or Multiple alphabet shifts. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can you know, you, you know, do more random versions of the substitution 
Yeah. There's also a problem with this as far as attacking it. If I wanted to break the encryption scheme of bad to CBT, <coughs> well, what's, well, what would I have to do? It's not that hard. But what if I, how would I brute force this? <coughs> Start at the beginning? Just rotate the alphabet 26 times, eventually the clear text is going to pop out. Right. So I have a, a finite number of combinations, in this case only 26, before clear text becomes available again. Follow me on this? Yep. So every time we make it a little bit harder, it's kind of, you have to take a step back and go, well, you know, how would I break into that? And it's helpful. In this case, the key is one, which is really, really easy, but within 26 times, I could, fig I could figure out what the key is. <coughs> I could tell you what the key is. If I had the pl uh, plain text and the cipher text, and I tried to attack this in a rotation, uh, a rotational alphabet, just rotating that alphabet 26 times through, eventually I'm going to get plain text again. So this wouldn't be that hard to crack, which is why they put it on cereal boxes. Well, and the other thing about sub substitution ciphers is anytime you're using a static key, uh, Great. You know, the English language has a lot of patterns in it, that, so it makes it really easy to break a substitution cipher, regardless of what... You bring up the subject of frequency analysis attack. This is subject to a frequency analysis. We can see the patterns. You can even go RSTLNE if you want. Right, what's some RSTLNE? The, the, the uh, Will of Fortune. Mm -hmm. No, it's, yes, it's the, the uh, frequency in which letters appear or something like that. It's the most popular occurrence of letters, which is a frequency, which ones appear the most. So you can, you can apply that here. So how can I make this even stronger? What, can I use a different key each day? Yeah. I could rotate the keys, right? So not only, but you'd still be able to figure it out because you just rotate 26 times and figure it out. So it really doesn't make sense for me to rotate the keys, although I could. This is just too easy for it to apply. You could, you could also rotate with each letter that you're substituting. Could. Makes it a little more difficult. Right, we're all, you know, the, the, the people who are hiding stuff have been fighting the people that are trying to unhide this stuff for years. For years. And it looks like the people hiding this stuff have the competitive advantage because of computers, because they can make the work factor just astronomically low. Isn't that what kind of what Enigma did with rotate these screens? Yeah, it's exactly what the Enigma did. They, they had the machine, they had the plain text, they had the cypher sex, they couldn't, they couldn't figure it out because they, couldn't un they didn't know how to plug in the dials in the front of it, or the pins in the front of it. So transposition, this is where you, you cannot take one out and replace it with another, but you can scramble it. So rook's cube. Then you've got running ciphers. This is the pro this is a process where the number of steps are interrelated. Following the steps uncovers the message. Or concealment ciphers. Uh, a situation where only a subset of the data is considered valid for legitimate transmission. For example, every fourth word. Every fourth word means something. And Wikipedia does a really good job on explaining these, probably a little bit too much, because the, there's no shortage of uh, info on you know each cipher. What's the? Isn't like the CIA cipher or something like that that's been out there, or, or there's certain there's pieces of it that they've been out there for 20, 30, even maybe longer, and they still haven't been able to break it. I'm sure. There's a website where there's a there's an MD hash on the home page in, the, in inside the logo and the, on the presidential seal, if you will. <laughs> anyway, and um, and people are still trying to figure out what that uh, the hash is. I don't know how they figure it out. Go with the story, man. Oh, you get us a little hope. I don't know who these guys are. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so block site versus stream site, all right? Block is a larger in, in, uh, increment. Normally, you can just assume 64. That's not always the case. Some use 128. 64 is a good round number. It tends to be much, much faster. What's that? Moving on. Stream ciphers, one bit or byte at a time. 
of the big picture here. So this is the increment in which you work with. Plus stream cipher is a great analogy as a, as a conveyor belt. Let's write some keywords down for Stego. I'm going to just let you write them all down here. Write down least significant bit. Is it least? Least. Not the most, but the least. Least significant bit. Also, you can write down the art of data hiding. The art of data hiding. Normally when you see those keywords, we're really talking about Stego. So those are the giveaways. Definitely remember those two words. But the, the strategy here is hiding a message in other media. It could be an MP3, it could be a WAV file, it could be a text file, it could be video for that matter. But you're embedding one message within another. Right, this is not the courtroom person, the stenographer. This is Stegano, as opposed to uh, Steno. All right, so historically used within imaged files, almost the easy, low hanging fruit. Text is inserted inside the file, so if I'm inserting inside the file, that means I'm doing what? Keyword, I'm looking for a keyword. Embedding. If I'm, am I adding or deleting? Adding. adding. So if I'm adding something, then I'm altering it. I'm altering it, changing it, modifying it. So the file no longer has integrity. It looks the same, but when we analyze it with our integrity algorithms, they're going to detect the difference. So if I have a known reference of what all of my pictures are, and then I somebody adds a you know, secret message to it, and then I compare the hashes, I'll be able to tell which one has the image in it because, well, it's changed. Yeah. Right. You can use it with an HTML, graphics, sound, audio, video. Special software is needed. You need tools like uh, Stego Magic or something like that. can be used as an, uh, as an augment to encryption. In many cases, you're hiding stuff in plain sight. There's two major groups of people that um, that really do a lot with uh, stenography, and that would be uh, pedophiles and uh, terrorists. They seem to be the two groups of people that are trying to hide things in images, like passwords to sites and secret locations of data. According to a conversation I had with a person who worked at the FBI. But let's talk about the government's involvement, albeit significant. Uh, let's see. Historically, the government of the U.S. tried to prevent high levels of encryption from falling into hostile hands. That was regulated by NSA. They tried to prohibit the export of 128 bit encryption for a very long time. In the late 90s, that was changed. Exporting of high encryption is allowed, provided the country, that the country of destination was not listed basically in hostile nations. But the other flip side of that is lots of countries don't allow you to, maybe not to import, but to, I've understood a lot of countries don't allow you to, to use encryption on their systems if you're in there. Uh, many, countries, many countries say no encrypting. Right. They have the fear of... Uh, They'll come after you. Yeah, they have the fear of why are you hiding something. <clears throat> You know, we're the government, we're the only people that can hide something. Right. Or I'm the ruler, I'm the dictator, I'm the whatever substitute the scenario, but yeah. Not, and not everybody can just. So it's one thing to say whether or not you can export it, but can you, are you, will you be sought if you use it? For whatever country you're in, you gotta follow their rules. A lot of, you know, a lot of governments that don't allow their people to encrypt would very much like to have our encryption schemes available to them. Right? Yeah. No, you can't. Some countries, yeah, you, can, you can't just go into Cuba and say, I'm going to you know, hide stuff. The government can protect anything they want, but the individuals... 
Right. So. Right. Like you can encrypt all the files on your hard drive at home. Imagine living in a place where you, you'd be killed for that. All right, so another significant piece of the, our U.S. government's involvement is something called the clipper chip. Yeah, this is, uh, I find this so interesting. You know, you got the clipper chip, and here's the, here's the, the history of it. Uh, the Cold War was is out and about, and uh, everybody was afraid the Russians were going to listen to the comm lines for the United States. So the government came up with a great solution. They said, you know what, we'll encrypt all telephone lines. And it sounds great. Until you go, well, who's going to keep a copy of all the keys for the encrypting and decryption process? And the government raised its hands and said, oh, we'll keep all of that. And all the people freaked out and went, well, no, because then you could encrypt and decrypt on the fly, and basically Big Brother could be listening. And everybody freaked out, and it never went past a conceptual idea. Never made it to production. Never really publicly tested. I think that's really tied to, I mean, NSA was involved there, but I think it's tied to the FBI wanting to have the, needing the ability to be able to eavesdrop on... Right, they wanted to be able to tap lines. Tap lines and carry out their law enforcement. Yeah. yeah. Which is, you know, which is, quite frankly, a, a huge um, ability within the, within the government to, the law enforcement, the ability to, to eavesdrop. Right. The outcry was the invasion of privacy. And so they were like, no way. Now let's fast forward 20 years till today. And that same conversation is happening again, just so that you have the players. And all of a sudden it's, you're, you're, you're in many cases, if you pay attention, you see that same outcry for privacy. You have to know that the, uh, here, uh, Uh, you have to write this down. Uh, uh, Clipper chip used the skipjack algorithm, which I used an 80-bit key. Write that down. Skipjack 80-bit key. That's a common, easy practice dust question. Unfortunately, this is outdated, and you know, but it serves the, it serves the story of history, basically. So you use skipjack and what? Skipjack 80 bits. Skipjack 80 bits. <coughs> All right, next you got key escrows. This is a concept where the private key is divided between two agencies. So to really understand what this does, you have to understand what private keys do. And private keys can sign documents or decrypt documents. 